Books and Books. My name is Ketsia and I am part of the children's department here at Books and Books. Thank you all for joining us this evening and thanks to our internet audience for tuning in with us. You're all in for a great trade today so you can keep up with our events online and for those of you who are here can pick up a calendar at our register so you can enjoy many more events like this. For those of you online, if you'd like to purchase a book and have it personalized by Mr. Ford, call the number on your screen and we'll ship it to you wherever you are in the US. We look forward from hearing to you. Now about the book and the author. Jasper Ford spent 20 years in the film business before debuting on the New York Times bestseller list with The Air Affair in 2001. Since then, he has written another six novels featuring his literary detective heroine, Thursday Next. Ford's writing is an eclectic mix of genres, which might be described as a joyful blend of comedy, sci-fi, thriller, crime, and satire. He freely admits that he is fascinated not just by books themselves, but by the way we read and what we read. And his reinvigoration of the tired genres have won him many enthusiastic supporters across the world. But for tonight, we are focusing on a series for young adults about magic and dragons set in a shabby world of failing magical powers, the Chronicles of Kazam series. In the good old days, magic was powerful, unregulated by the government, and even the largest spell could be woven without filling or filing in a magic release form, B17G. Then the magic started fading away. Powerful wizards who were once controlled the weather now did home improvements, plumbing and wiring, drain unblocking and mold charming. I run Kazam, an unemployment an employment agency for sorcerers. Work is drying up, drain cleaner is cheaper than a spell and even magic carpets are now reduced to pizza deliveries. So it was a surprise when Kevin's vision started. Not only did they predict the death of the last dragon by a dragon slayer, they also did suggest that I might have something to do with it. It was something that comes once in 20 lifetimes and changes everything for good or bad. Something like a big magic. The question was, who was the dragon slayer and do they want it to kill the last dragon? Two people have tried to kill me. I was threatened with jail, had 16 offers of marriage and was outlawed by the King of Snod. Today you will not have heard of me. My name is Jeff Jennifer S Strange. With great anticipation and telling us a little bit more about our heroine Jennifer Strange in the Kazam Agency, let's give a warm Miami welcome to Mr. Jasper Ford. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, rousing intro. Um, it's, sometimes it's, uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's a bit strange because I, I often come and tour books um, that I wrote like a year ago. And when I'm writing another book, of course, uh, it seems like even longer. So I have to then actually try and think what the book is about um, and, and try and reread it or look at it. Anyway, so what I've got, I've got about an hour to talk uh, about, uh, about uh, the Eye of Zoltar and writing in general and stuff and things. Um, we will have a good opportunity for questions um, at the end. Questions are really good because questions allow me to figure out how I wrote. Now, that may sound a bit sort of counterintuitive, but the interesting thing about any creative endeavor is you discover a lot about yourself whilst you're doing it. And the, the wonderful thing about being an author rather than being a painter or a sculptor is that you guys ask me direct questions that I then have to think up a really good answer for. Uh, and artists and sculptors don't quite have that in the same way. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, I didn't know how I wrote when I started uh, being published. I'd written six novels in 11 years, one of them which was uh, The Last Dragon Slayer. I originally wrote Last Dragon Slayer in 1997, I think it was, and it just sat on my hard drive for nearly 15 years, gathering electrons before I finally got it published. Um, but, uh, but in that time, um, I really didn't know how I, was, how I was writing. I was simply writing what I thought was fun and interesting and amusing. And it was only when I got to be published and I was talking to good folk uh, like yourselves, and someone put up their hand and said, uh, you know, why did you think up this idea, or why did you think up that idea, or why do you think this is funny, or why do you think that uh, works, why do you think that doesn't work? And I'm sort of thinking, and, and then all of a sudden I started to realize um, why I did it. So thank you, I'd like to say, to everyone who's ever asked me a question about why I wrote. Um, so anyway, so think up some really good questions, and, and at the end we'll, um, we'll hopefully try and, try and answer them. 
Now, the interesting thing, what did I discover today? Okay, what I discovered today is that children are very, very smart. Okay, this was a good one. I was talking to some uh, kids here in Miami, and uh, we were talking about creati uh, pro possible cr careers in uh, creativity. And I was asking them, you know, to say what, what was a good idea, what, you know, writing, novels, you know, poetry, songwriting. And advertising usually comes up, and, uh, and I said, okay, yeah, advertising. Now, tell me, um, if you were selling lemonade outside the front of your house, uh, and you wanted to have a sign, right, should you have it misspelt and written badly or spelt properly and in good handwriting, which would sell more lemonade? And, of course, they all instantly knew that the bad spelling would sell more lemonade, right? And these, these are kids who are, like, you know, nine, ten. And, uh, and I said, why? And they said, because, uh, because adults will think it's cute and funny. So they've totally got your number as we say. But uh, there you go, advertising executives at the age of nine, they, they absolutely understood it. And that was uh, wonderful. So I discovered that this morning. Anyway, um, right, so we've got about an, an hour, as I said. We're going to have some questions at the end. I'll talk a little bit about the book. I'll talk a little bit about the writing process, uh, which, which I think is, uh, is quite interesting. I'll try not to read too much from the book, because you can do that, of course, in the safety of your own homes. Um, and you might not have actually read it yet, so I don't want to have any spoilers. Um, but I will tell you a little bit about the story. Um, now, the, uh, the last Dragon Slayer series, as I said, was one that uh, came to me a long, long time ago um, and was, uh, was sort of brought into being by my agent, who, who suddenly sort of had this memory and said, Jasper, do you, still have, do you still have the last Dragon Slayer? And I said, yes, of course I do. She said, send it to me again, will you? So I did, and she went, oh, I can so sell this. It was absolutely, you know, just at the right time. Um, and rather foolishly, um, she, well, she said, uh, do you think you could do two books a year? And rather foolishly, I said, yes, of course I can. You know, how hard can it be? Um, it's, very, it's very hard. I can just about manage one book uh, a year. Um, so they've been a little bit um, slow coming out because I've got to do my other novels as well. But um, The Last Dragon Slayer is, uh, is what I do usually when I take an idea or a genre. I, I look at the way it's usually done, and then I turn it on its head and look at it in a completely different way. Uh, the first book I ever wrote, uh, you'll get a bit of a history of, of Jasper Ford as a, as a writer. The first book I ever wrote was a, um, uh, was a murder mystery with a nursery, nursery rhyme figure, Humpty Dumpty, in fact. Um, this, this came out eventually as The Big Over Easy. Um, and what I was trying to do was actually to have fun with a very tired genre of crime thrillers. Uh, here, is a, here is a genre. Uh, which has been going for a great many years and hasn't changed a huge amount. The fact that we can move it to Scandinavia and everyone thinks it's all fresh and new and exciting just shows how incredibly tired this is as a genre. You just have to change one tiny thing. And uh, Scandinoir has must have come over to you guys here in the States, hasn't it? Yeah, and it was uh, it's huge. And everyone's going, wow, it's like so new and fresh and different. And I'm going, is it? Is it really? But... Um, <laughs> But it's kind of nice. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about the crime genre, of course, is, is because um, we all love, uh, as humans, we all crave justice. We all crave that justice is done and that evildoers are eventually punished. And uh, when we stop enjoying crime, I think it'll be a very dark day for the human race when we can't see the right and wrong and the morality of these things. So, uh, so go crime, is what I say. <laughs> um, but what I was doing is I was saying, right, um, this is a kind of fusion really. If you, take, you take crime thrillers, uh, you take, uh, yes, you take crime thrillers and you take the nursery rhymes and you put them together and you get nursery crimes. And, and out of this sort of strange fusion, you get this nice little bubbling new mix of ideas. Um, and I think fantasy is the cutting edge of uh, literature, as far as I'm concerned. It's new, it's exciting, it's fresh. And the wonderful thing you can do with fantasy is there's basically no rules. There's no rules at all. Um, and what you can do is you can take an ordinary idea, you can mix it up, and then you can create an entirely new way of creating drama. It's, it's not the rules aren't like the normal world. They're di slightly different rules. And in those slightly different rules, there are new ways of making exciting drama. And that's why I think fantasy works really, really well. Um, it's also a great way of bringing satire in. There's a, there's a lot of satire in the, uh, in the uh, Last Dragon Slayer series, and you can have a lot of jokes, and you can make things very thought-provoking. Um, humans are very faddy. They're very sort of sheepy, really. We do things... Uh, very, we're think, uh, creatures of great habit. You know, we do things because we've always done them. It's very strange. Um, 
Uh, but if we were to do them slightly differently, then there's, there's a sort of possibility you can look at, look at things in another way. And, and again, there's some very exciting uh, ideas you can bring out through, uh, through fantasy and fiction. Um, Anyway, so, um, so when I was writing uh, the, the last Dragon Slayer series, I thought, right, let's take magic and dragons and that sort of stuff, and let's sort of change it round a bit. Because the problem with magic, of course, is that you can just make, it's like time travel. You could sort of go back and everything would be normal again. So there always have to be barriers to, the, to these endeavors. There has to be a way in which you can't do it in time travel. There has to be a way in which magic doesn't quite work. You ha always have to have these little caveats, otherwise everything becomes too easy. And uh, often when you're writing, or when I'm writing, I find that, uh, that actually a, uh, a book is like a giant obstacle course for your protagonist. And your, your, your protagonist, uh, your character, has to go from A to B, and all the way along their route is littered with obstacles, some physical, some mentally, mental, some ethical, but a lot of barriers that have to be either got over, got round, removed, and whatever. Uh, and that's what makes, I think, an exciting story. So, so in my book, instead of how magic, all powerful and fantastic and amazing, I thought, let's have a sort of faded, I, d I do like faded grandeur, you know, it's like looking at those, you know, those wonderful picture books you get of, um, of, of old country houses which are now faded, falling into disrepair, and then you know, the plaster is falling off the walls. There's something very romantic about that notion of something that was great and is now sort of faded and, and, and past its best. And I thought, let's take the magic industry. So you have all these marvellous, fantastic magicians, wizards, sorcerers, um, uh, and they used to be all powerful, and they used to be at the side of um, of emperors and kings and queens and um, and socialist collectives. And but now they're not, and they're doing this very mundane jobs of unblocking drains, getting cats out of trees, and, and stuff like that. And and they're sort of once mighty, sort of fallen people. Um, but in this world, I called it the ununited kingdoms because I kind of like that idea. It was um, maybe a sort of foreshadow to the. <laughs> Uh, Scottish referendum we had the other day. Few <laughs> dodged a bullet there. Um, thank you, Scotland, for, um, for staying with us. We love you all. Um, uh, so, um, so in the un ununited kingdoms, I thought what I'd do is I'd have this, this failing magic, but also then add another few memes from the fantasy, the sort of uh, magical dragon fantasy world. Now, there's an awful lot of orphans in this kind of fantasy fiction. So I thought, um, rather than not use the orphan thing, I thought, let's use the orphan idea to the max, and let's create a, a, a country in which nearly everybody is an orphan. In fact, let's create an orphan-based economy. So you have an awful lot of orphans, and they're just basically cheap labor. So I thought, right, this is where my character, Jennifer Strange, clearly is. She's lost her parents to one of the endless troll wars that happen in this world from time to time, which, uh, which is one of those sort of wonderful sort of excursions you know, to the north, to Trollvania in the north of the ununited kingdoms. And we're going to kill all the trolls and it'll be fine. You know, t awful, terrible things. We're going to get rid of them all uh, and, and that's fine. Um, and there's a, a battle that lasts about half an hour uh, and the, the humans are roundly um, beaten. And there's, um, of course, all these orphans who eventually end up in terrible orphanages, you know, with sort of holes in the, the roof and everything. Really sort of rather Dickensian. Um, but I kind of like that idea. Um, and you can sort of, I can sort of take ideas and sort of play with them. Anyway, so Jennifer Strange is an orphan. And orphans are sold into, uh, into uh, 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 indentured servitude, which basically means that you're, you're sold by the orphanage for, uh, for, you know, a couple of hundred pounds. Um, and you have to go and work for someone for four years for no money before you get your sort of limited freedom. So it's a kind of rather sort of iniquitous system, but, um, but no one seems to notice it. Everyone thinks it's kind of normal. Um, she finds herself working for Kazam, which is one of the last houses of enchantment that rent out uh, magicians to do these sort of rather mundane jobs, you know, cats out of trees and stuff. Um, uh, working under somebody called the Great Zambini. Unfortunately, um, the Great Zambini, who... Um, her, has uh, trying to keep you know the, the whole house together does the one thing to earn a bit of money that of course is um, hugely shameful and will bring great um, great sort of humility upon him himself humiliation upon himself is that he decides to do children's parties uh, um, which is considered you know absolutely a terrible thing to do he has to do them in another town so no one recognizes him um, you know very very embarrassing um, and he, uh, at, th at the end of the, the party, he vanishes in a puff of smoke, and he vanished, uh, but he forgot how to unvanish. And now Jennifer Strange is left 
uh, with the reins of Kazam on her own, age 15, with nothing but a rather fearsome looking uh, pet called the Quark Beast, who is mo mostly teeth and mouth, it seems, uh, and very terrifying. Um, in this, uh, in, in, this uh, in this first book, we have, um, we have a, a dragon which is about to die, and we find that Jennifer Strange is the last dragon slayer and has to actually kill the dragon. The thing about a, a dragon dying is that when it does, um, his, uh, the, uh, he lives in a dragon land, which is surrounded by these marker stones, and when they lose their magic, um, the, uh, all of a sudden you can go in, you can actually enter the dragon lands and claim as much land as you want. So there is a nice interesting theme there about saying, right, what do we want? Do we want, uh, do we want dragons on this world, or do we want to just grab some land and some cash? So some interesting uh, ethical dilemmas for Jennifer. This was orig originally a, um, I won't tell you anymore, because just in case you haven't read it. Um, uh, this was originally a standalone. Like all my books, they start as standalones. Every single book that I've written that is now a series began as a standalone. Um, I don't seem to be able to just write standalones, unfortunately, without creating a huge, interesting, exciting, fun, and vibrant world that has so many question marks over it that it begs to have a sequel. Um, and I s have got stuck now with, I think, four series. Um, and the annoying thing about that, uh, for, me, or well, for me, is of course everybody wants their own favorite uh, series to be the next book I write. And the more series you have, of course, you multiply that by the number of series. That's how many years it will go by before you get your next book, which makes people slightly frustrated in a, in a good way, of course. You know, people demanding your next book is, is always a, a nice insult to hear. Where's my next book, Ford? And you go, oh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Oddly enough, actually, somebody said to me the other day, uh, I, I, read your last, uh, I read your last Thursday Next book, and I went, oh, thank you. And, uh, and she said, and, and it really made me cry. And I went, yes, like that. And I went, oh, sorry, I meant that in a good way. And she said, no, 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 you're right in a good way. But that's kind of weird thing to say. You know, my, your book made me cry. And I'm going, oh, great, you know, because obviously it had meant something to her. Um, I'd written a a story, it was rather strange, she, and then she went on to say, yes, and it was worse than that, because you made me cry for someone who didn't die but never existed. And that was kind of weird, and I went, yes, it was kind of weird, wasn't it? But uh, amazing what you can do when you're writing, uh, writing books. Um, anyway, so this wonderfully uh, sort of expansive world of the ununited kingdoms, I felt could be expanded into a, um, into a sequel, and that was the Song of the Quark Beast, which came out um, last year. Uh, where, which is really all about trying to control magic because once, uh, once magic was starting to get a, maybe a little bit stronger, of course, people, in, con people in, uh, in authority want to control it. They want to have it because they reckon that if you can control magic, you can essentially control everything. So the second book was really all about trying to gain control of magic. Um, the third book is, uh, is about trying to find this marvelous jewel called the Eye of Zoltar. Now, originally, this was a trilogy, this series, and this was going to be the last book. Um, but when I'm writing, and my writing technique is very much a question of just start writing and then see where it leads me. I mean, if you've ever read one of my books and had no idea where it was going, um, you're in good company because I had no <laughs> idea either. Um, often, I just, I just start on a, a train. It's a good place. If I'm completely stuck, if you're reading um, any of my books and it begins on a train, you know that I'm in, got in serious trouble starting the book. Because um, trains are wonderful ways to start uh, a story because uh, you're going somewhere, you've got two people talking, and then they arrive there and someone meets them and it all starts kicking off. Um, this doesn't start on a train, but, um, but I wasn't quite sure what, it was, what was gonna happen. Um, but I was having such fun with it because what I was doing was I thought, well, I like the, the concept of a journey. I want to take Jennifer Strange on a journey to another area within the ununited kingdoms um, and uh, she's v she is very very um, keen to say that it's not a quest right because quite a lot of people say well she's I'm going to find the eye of Zoltar I'm going into the Cambrian Empire which is this rather wild and lawless uh, nation next door to the kingdom of Snod where she lives um, and, and people say ah it must be a quest she said no 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 it's not a quest right because if it's a quest you have to register it with the questing foundation um, and you have to pay a lot of money uh, and then you have to have like giants and dwarves with you and they're very expensive because they have to be put up in proper hotels and they're strongly unionized. So, <laughs> so she says it's definitely not a quest. Um, but as, as, the, as the book goes through, she generally has to sort of admit that it might be a little questy, you know, in parts. 
But it's this sort of um, uh, maybe sort of um, self self-deprecating humor and the fact that these characters kind of have an idea that they're in a book and they're they're slightly railing against the the usual ways in which these books are talk th that I actually enjoy because these books I do not write in a vacuum I write these books knowing that you've read books similar to this perhaps when you were younger and and you understand the the genre that I'm actually trying to subvert um, uh, this, for me, The Eye of Zoltar, is one of my favorite books. Uh, I really, really enjoyed writing this, and this is probably why it didn't become the third in the trilogy. It just carried on going, because I was having such fun. Um, and all sorts of interesting concepts I managed to um, introduce. Um, firstly, um, I was um, obviously writing for children, and it is, I think it's a, it's a book that is very accessible, not just to children, uh, but also, also to adults as well. I like to try and... Um, make my books you know, uh, really accessible to everybody um, in a sort of um, Muppet show kind of way. You know. uh, my, my father, you know, uh, God bless him, wherever he is now. Um, actually, I know where he is now. He's making his way through eternity um, from uh, my mother's front garden. Um, but uh, he, was, uh, he, was not, um, he was not, shall we say, uh, had a, a tremendous sort of um, sense of humor. You know, he wasn't like you know, a, an extremely funny guy. But the one thing that he loved more than anything else was um, Pigs in Space uh, during the Muppet Show. Um, and, uh, you know, I never heard him tell a joke, ever. Um, no, there was the Three Ducks in Belfast joke. There was one joke, sorry. He did have that one joke, Three, three Ducks in Belfast. I, I can't tell it to you because I, I can't do a Belfast accent, but it's, um, it's about Three Ducks in Belfast. Um, and uh, so he never told a joke. But whenever we were watching, um, well, when I was watching the Muppet Show, and I'm talking about the proper Muppet Show, the one we had back in the 70s, which you can now get on YouTube a bit. Um, and he used to come in and go, uh, 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 Jasper, are you, are you watching, um, are you watching the, um, the Muppet Show? And I will go, yeah, yes, Father, I am. He goes, uh, well, tell me when Pigs in Space are on, won't you? <laughs> and I went, all right, Dad. And, uh, and when pig, and Pigs in Space, Dad, Dad. And he used to come through and he used to go, ha, 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 ha. You know, the swine trek and all that. You know, and they're, they're about to find out the meaning of life, but it's... Um, it's some um, beef strong enough or something for supper and they all have to go off and eat, you know. Um, and when it was finished, he, he went off and that was it, you know. And I said, don't you want to stay for the Swedish chef? And he went, no, no, <laughs> just, the, uh, just the Muppet Show, just the um, Pigs in Space. But uh, the point is that Muppet Show had a wonderful way of being funny to everybody. It was an, an, like an every humor, an every story. Um, and it was very complex and very simple all at the same time. You know, if you were to examine in intellectual detail the love triangle between Kermit and Miss Piggy and that other pig whose name I can't quite remember. Um, it's immensely complex, but actually very, very simple at the same time. And that's what I sort of try and do with my books. Um, so in this, um, uh, children can understand a huge complex plots, uh, I must say. People say to me, you know, how do you, what's the difference between writing for children and writing for adults? Well, first of all, I say I kind of write for the children in adults anyway. So I'm kind of already sort of halfway there. You know, it's, I don't do really serious, heavy literature. You know, I'm always slightly light and frothy. So I'm kind of halfway there already. Um, what I do is I kind of lower the age of the protagonist because children really don't want to read about an adult doing stuff because that's kind of boring because adults are boring, let's face it. Um, uh, so lower the, age, lower the age of the protagonist. Um, take out a lot of illusion because, of course, children have had less time in which to understand allusion to everything that goes on around us. Not take it all out, but take a lot of it out. Um, and also just cut down on the number of subplots, just to make it a little less complicated. Um, and that's basically it. Everything else, they can understand. Betrayal, you know, friendship, um, sacrifice, all that stuff, you know, anger, dealing with ethical issues. These guys go to school. They have it all. You know, it's there in the playground. You know, you can totally understand it. Like I was telling this morning about the kids who understand about lemonade spelt wrongly. They totally, go, totally understand it. Um, so I thought, you know, as I do, do you know what? Uh, kids must have heard about the, the downturn, you know, the, um, all that uh, stuff with the bankers that was going on. So I thought, why don't I just sneak in a few little lessons in economics? Because, you know, economics, when I, was, when I was a kid, was hugely boring and you couldn't possibly understand it. But I have explained um, a few, you know, of the principles behind economics to kids. And they go, is it really that easy? And I go, well, basically, yeah. You know, and anything more complicated, the grown-ups don't understand it either. And they went, oh, okay. Um, 
So, um, so what I've done is I sort of sneaked it in. So I've got this princess who is um, disguised as a handmaiden. Um, and for some reason, as a princess, she's very interested in economics. Um, so we have a little lesson in here about the, um, the uh, um, options markets. Now, now, options markets might seem a little bit complex, but when you talk about options market and marriage options for princesses, right, it suddenly becomes actually sort of very much more possible to explain. Uh, because if you're a princess, of course, you can be sold. The option to your hand in marriage can be sold to another kingdom, like two kingdoms away, for a small amount of money. And if you grow up to be a princess who's, uh, who's beautiful and funny and witty and wise, then obviously um, your, the option is worth a lot of money, right? All of a sudden you have a, a very, you know, very, you know, you spend a lot of money and it's, it's making a lot of sense. But also that you can then trade that option and sell it to someone else. Um, and and it's, it makes kind of sense. And uh, then I sort of put in the fact that um, uh, that's why uh, kings and queens have so many children. So they can make lots of money on the option rights. Um, and, uh, and of course, yeah, it makes total sense. And later on in the book, uh, the princess t tries, to, um, tries to manipulate the, uh, the stock market and is eventually arrested for it, which I thought was quite, uh, was quite amusing. Um, but again, just a little sort of lessons about economics in a very simple uh, way explaining these things. Um, when I was writing about um, the Eye of Zoltar, I, uh, I have another problem with dragons, of course, being in my books, because dragons are all powerful. So I had to make the dragons in my books sort of not very powerful. Um, so one of my dragons it actually uh, turns out, um, ch gets turned into rubber quite early on in the book and remains so for most of the book. Um, and of course, how do you deal with a big rubber dragon that you have to take everywhere with you? And um, his name's Colin, and he's known as Rubber Colin <laughs> when he's made out of rubber. And in fact, that, he's actually on the cover. There's a little, little Rubber Colin just there. You know, how do we get him back? Well, I think he'll probably change back on his own, but don't worry about it. Um, they go traveling through this, um, this, this nation uh, called the Cambrian Empire, which is a sort of lawless nation. It's, it's, it's in Wales. It's set in Wales, because I live in Wales, and I love Wales. And uh, it's set in Wales, and it's a kind of mix between... I don't know, it's a bit like sort of, I don't know, sort of Wales and Afghanistan, really, I suppose. Um, sort of ruled over by sort of law lord, or warlords. Um, but um, a, a very dangerous place to be. But what they've done is they've capitalized on the danger by opening it to jeopardy tourism. Now, this is a concept that I rather like because um, I don't know what it's like here in the, in the States, but in the UK, um, everyone talks about health and safety. And no one must hurt themselves. You know, you must avoid hurting yourselves at all costs. So we live very, very safe lives. And life, that, you know, life is getting safer and safer. So I thought if you had a country where you went to uh, where things were incredibly dangerous, you'd actually be a really good tourist uh, destination. So you go to, you go to the Cambrian Empire on a touris, uh, Jeopardy tourism uh, with the possibility that you might be eaten by something in unspeakably unpleasant. You go, yes, great. Um, uh, and when you arrive there, you, um, you, you go and see the tourist, uh, tourist office and they, uh, they say, well, what would you like to do? And there's a whole array of things with different types of danger going right down to um, um, Cambrianopolis is the, um, is the capital city. And the least dangerous thing you can do is go to the summer sales in Cambrianopolis, <laughs> um, which still have a, a death rating of 1%, uh, <laughs> meaning, that, um, meaning that out of 100 people that go to the summer sales, at least one of them is going to die. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then it rises up to about 65% for um, uh, wrestling with flesh-eating slugs, uh, which is an um, incredibly dangerous thing to do. And, of course, everyone streams into this country, absolutely delighted to somehow have a little bit of danger and jeopardy in their lives, which I, I kind of enjoy. Um, they are trying to find the Eye of Zoltar, uh, a mysterious, um, huge grater. I think it's sort of like a, a, a sapphire about the size of a goose's egg which is meant to hold um, huge powers and was um, originally used in, um, by, a, uh, by one of the early, um, um, early pharaohs of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt to actually sort of um, lay sway to vast quantities of ancient Egypt. Um, and now it's been hidden somewhere and they have to try and find it. It looks like it might have been, uh, been uh, uh, hidden or in the possession of a sky pirate who flies around on huge, great um, leviathans, great sort of great whale-like creatures that can fly in the sky. So we, we have a lot of fun with things like this. We have a lot of fun. Um, I won't tell you too much more about it. I wonder if I could read a, read a small section 
perhaps if only I had if only I had hang on I'll find a very small section to read um, here we go here we go here we go here we go oh sorry Okay, this is um, this is more of a. This is, I, I, every now and again, I just pop in little sort of more grown-up jokes. This is um, this is one of them. Um, uh, they, t they take a half track, an old military half track, to because to go across the Cambrian Empire because it doesn't have any roads, obviously, because it's wild and lawless, and roads would be impractical if you wanted to have a wild and lawless place. Um, the half track was neither fast nor quiet, so to conserve fuel and our eardrums, I drove as slowly as practical. We spent the time taking in the spectacular local, local countryside. It was utterly unspoiled. There were few modern buildings, no shopping malls or fast food joints, and no billboards, electricity poles, or other modern contrivances. Away from the almond groves, broadleaf forests covered much of the lowlands. The small houses dotted haphazardly about were constructed of stone with riveted steel roofs, and all were fortified in some way. What's a Sonombivorus? asked the princess, who had been reading enjoy the unspoiled charms of the Cambrian Empire without death or serious injury. Just one of the sort of guidebooks you, you have, you know, for going into the Cambrian Empire. It looks like a cross between a baobab and a turnip, explained Addy. Addy is their tour guide. And it's about the size of a phone booth. It's actually not a plant at all, but a fungus that releases puffs of hallucinogenic spores into the breeze. If you inhale them, you become suddenly convinced that being near the, the sombud Sonombivorus will enlighten you with devastatingly relevant social and political commentary. Once there, of course, you will soon overcome with a sense of listlessness and torpidity and fall fast asleep. It sounds, it sounds like what would happen if you weaponized French cinema, I observed. <laughs> Pretty much, if French cinema secretes enzymes from its roots and dissolves you while you sleep. Yag, said the princess, and returned to the book. So there you are, you have a little, so there's a, so there are a, few, a few jokes for grown-ups, but I like the idea of weaponising French cinema, you know, <laughs> you know it's quite, quite fun. Um, have, let's, have a few, let's have some questions, then I can go off on an interesting tangent, perhaps. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, reading the books, we, of course, we uh, have this very strong feeling that we, we love literature, mm. we, we enjoy the book more because we love literature, we love books and everything else. When you were growing up, were you an avid reader? Did you read a lot? Uh, and what did you read? OK, uh, I'll, repeat the, I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear. Um, a, lot, a lot of my, well, more the Thursday Next books, perhaps, but all my books, um, they're sort of peppered with a lot of literary uh, reference and allusion. And the question really is, you know, did I read a lot uh, when I was a, a kid? Um, the, answer, the answer is yes. Um, all, all, my, all my school reports, I was a very, very bad student, and all my school reports were pretty awful. You know, must try harder um, should should actually be the Ford family motto or my personal uh, mo motto. Um, um, yeah, must try harder. Um, but the one thing that I was always good at, I was always like sort of 39 out of 41 in my class. I, I don't know what the other two or three were doing, but uh, I was never quite at the bottom, but almost there. Um, but the one thing that was always good uh, and strong was my reading age and reading ability. Um, I could read fairly early. Um, and I always loved stories. Uh, and not stories just as in written stories, but stories um, in cinema, stories on the TV, stories on the radio, jokes, which are little stories in themselves. I love jokes because they're perfect little stories. They're just little nuggets, encapsulated stories. A really good joke, set up, pay off, bang, you're there. It's just like you know, the crack cocaine of the literature world. <laughs> Um, no, that's poetry, actually. Poetry is the crack cocaine of the literature world, you know, because it goes right in, mi you know, goes straight into the soul and just misses out anything, anything else on the way, just bang, hits you straight there. Um, so I always, I always love stories um, and, and reading. Um, but the, the strange thing is that I can remember having this, this wonderful gift um, to be able to read, you know, that, that, that we all, all of us who are fortunate enough to be able to read. It, it, and I remember actually attaining this, this, this skill that all of a sudden I could read. Because if you think about it, the first 30 or 40 books that you, that you read, you're told to read. Um, it was, um, in, in my day, in Britain, it was something called uh, Ladybird Books, Ladybird 1B, 
you know, adventure in the castle. And there was um, sort of, what is his name? So uh, Jim and J John and Jane and Pat the dog. You know, I didn't get the Pat the dog pun for years, years until suddenly it struck me. Oh, Pat the dog, of course, yes. It's so obvious now. Um, so you're, you're told to read these books. But once you can read, then there is this sort of almost um, exciting sort of, um, uh, I don't know how to best to describe it, but this uh, sudden feeling of attainment. I can read, which means I can choose something to read. Now, I remember this very, very clearly when I was a kid. Um, and I, I, could, I could read. Wait a moment. I can read. That means I can go and choose something. So I'm going to go and choose something to read. So I went to my parents' library. And I don't mean like a big room full of books. I mean like a bookcase. Um, and, and dad was uh, an economist. So a lot of them were very, very boring books indeed. Um, uh, but there was one book that I found that had illustrations in it and dialogue. And what use is a book without um, illustrations or dialogue? Uh, and this was Alice in Wonderland. And, and I read through it, right, um, you know, curled up on the window seat in my imagination. We didn't have a window seat. Um, I just sat in a chair, I should imagine. Um, and, and I read this book through, and I read it through again <laughs> because I loved it, and I could understand it, and I really, really understood what the author was trying to say I, and understood the subtleness of the, the language, the excitement, and the humor. It's not a laugh out loud book, but it is infused with charm and humor and just wonderful delightfulness, if that's a word. Um, and this kind of stuck with me, really. Um, and I just carried on from there, just reading books whenever I could. Um, and, and that, in fact, carried on even in my 20s when I was working. Um, I just carried on writing. I got, I got more into the, um, I was a very bad student, as I said. Left school at 18, but actually my kind of schooling really finished at 16. Um, we have, oh, I don't know what you guys have, but we have A-levels that you do between, um, between the ages of 16 and 18. So there's two years to do your A-levels. I, I got a grade D in art, um, and that was it uh, for me. So essentially my, my education finished at the age of 16. But it didn't, of course, because school is one thing. Learning outside school is quite another. I just carried on reading uh, voraciously. I still do. You know, Wikipedia was designed just for me, as far <laughs> as I'm concerned. Um, and and the, you know, you just you go from one link to another, and you start off, you know, reading up about the Lusitania, and then ten minutes later, you're reading about the Norwegian leather industry, and you've no idea how you got there, but it was very exciting on the way. Um, the random button is wicked on Wikipedia. Press the random button, and you get these fantastically bizarre, strange, you know, strange things. Like um, somebody has has done motorway interchanges <laughs> on Wikipedia in the UK, you know, and tells you, you know, the shortest motorway, the longest motorway, the motorway with the most amount of lanes, 17. <laughs> Amazing what sticks in your head. Um, but I, th I think that's also reflects in my books is that I've always been a tremendous, um, voracious appetite for facts and interesting stuff, not only about um, books, but about characters and just interesting things, you know, uh, uh, economics, um, Jeopardy tourism, all these kind of ideas I really, really like and enjoy. Um, there's, a, there's a sequence in here where, um, where a, a human gets a master reset. Uh, and I just love the idea that you could actually have a master reset, because I have a dog, uh, a spaniel, actually. We call him Needy Spaniel. Um, <laughs> But he's not actually, uh, that's not his name. His name's Ozzy. Um, but he, he's, um, he's so needy that, in fact, that um, he'll actually forget who his owners are because anyone who's nice to him is a, his owner. Um, so after about nine days, he forgets who we are, right? So if we go away for longer than nine days, he forgets us. Um, and, and, and we refer to it that somebody's pressed Ozzy's reset, master reset button. And if you, like, hold one ear and then sort of, you know, like, sort of, you know, push his nose and hold, um, <laughs> he'll go loose and then he'll sort of wake up again and, uh, and then, he'll, uh, then he'll know us again. He'll look around and go, right, where are the humans? And you go, ah, oh, there's a human, right, you're my friend, you know, and he's needy spaniel. So, so all these things that happen and the idea of master reset on a dog or even on a human is, is quite an exciting idea. So, um, so, you know, I just take stuff from everywhere. But no, voracious appetite and an inquiring mind. Um, with my own children, of which I have um, quite a few, um, I always maintained, you know, because I, because I did actually, you know, reasonably well in life and career, 
without uh, you know fantastic education is that actually my my job uh, as as a as a sort of uh, as a parent is actually to instill an inquiring mind in a child and I figure that if you're if you work hard and you have an inquiring mind and a sense of humor then everything will just slot into place you know and perhaps a little too much stead is uh, is taken by um, academia and endless uh, attainment um, that in fact you can just do a huge amount with a good smile an inquiring mind and some hard work um, anyway yes another question how are we doing we're doing good another question another question yes do you ever have a clear idea of where your books will end or do they all form in the act of writing um, right do do I have a clear idea where they end or do they sort of form in the act of writing um, mostly they kind of sort of fall where they they do um, I, I, the way I work, this is kind of a strange one, um, is I, I tend to work with a series of narr what I call narrative dares. Um, I set myself a dare, and then I have to write myself my, my, my way out of it. Um, now, this is actually quite an interesting way to work uh, as, as an author. And I came across this theory when I, you remember I was telling you earlier about how you guys uh, sort of tell me how I wrote, you know, this wonderful sort of journey of self discovery. Um, and I, I came across this theory about, um, about three or four years ago when I was thinking about it, trying to find some unifying sort of way in which I wrote books. And, and the narrative dare is it, is that for all my books, I've actually taken a concept, Humpty Dumpty is murdered, who's responsible, right? Uh, the three bears, why was the porridge at different temperatures when it was poured at the same time? A explain, <laughs> you know, 100,000 words, that's all the book does. The Humpty Dumpty book, that's all it does. Why did he fall off the wall? Why was he sitting on a wall? Why was he sitting on a wall in a shabby area of town? Bit weird, you know. Um, but not why was he an egg, that'd be too obvious, you know. Um, then with the Thursday Next series, Jane Eyre is kidnapped out of Jane Eyre, someone has to get her back. Um, with my shades of grey, my shades of grey, not the other shades of grey, or, um, <laughs> my, 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 or 49 fewer shades of grey. Um, <laughs> as I call my shades grey, because it, it can't be less, it has to be fewer, of course. Um, it, was, it was try and describe a, uh, a, so, a social hierarchy that is based entirely on visual colour, you know, which is quite a, pro, quite a dare. I, I might be. Okay. Yeah, quite a dare. So, so all of these ideas, um, try and retell, retra, retell um, you know, a, a, a magic story without getting sort of bogged down in the usual way of telling stories. So I, I generally sort of start off with, with a dare or several dares and say, right, how can we, how can we make this go? Um, how can we make this work? And all the s short stories I did before I was a published author, because before I'd written my, my six novels that I wrote before I got published, I'd done about 22 short stories. And all of them had a central, difficult dare. And the great thing about having a narrative dare is that if you don't let yourself off the hook, you actually have to be sometimes quite crafty in the way in which you tell the story. Because a story, um, I always think that um, silly is good, stupid is bad, right? I write silly, right, not stupid, because there's just a knife edge, and sometimes I'm right on that knife edge. Um, silly is definitely very, very good. Um, and if you have a very, very difficult, stupid concept, then you have to be very careful and very, you know, try and use as much skill as you can to not make it stupid, to just make it, just make it silly. Um, so the narrative dare idea does actually work quite quite well. If you imagine um, writing as a um, as a uh, uh, a toolbox, you know, because I'm I, I love playing with you know cars and airplanes and stuff like that, you know, spanners and screwdrivers and all that. Um, if you can imagine a big toolbox, you know, and and you know on the top layer of the toolbox there's all this sort of you know screwdrivers and spanners and a hammer, you know, you can basically figure out what they do. And that's like that's like writing, you know. There's there's the general sort of you know there's there's punctuations, there's he said, he said, she said, there's, you know, there's characters and all that. But then when you open, you know, and get to the lower level of the toolbox, there's all sorts of other interesting things like inferred narratives and reader expectation, all these wonderful little things that you can play with, you know, the real sort of, um, you know, writing 2.0 stuff, you know, really, really get into it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good way to work, I find, working with this sort of narrative dare idea. Um, the book I'm working on at the moment, which will be coming out this time next year, um, the narrative dare is um, uh, humans have always hibernated. Let's tell a story about that. So it's 
quite an interesting concept. Okay, what if all humans, if we had always slept between uh, November and March of every year? We'd do it because it's very, very cold, so we have a very icy world that we live in. Um, but who looks after us when, we, when we're asleep? And is villainy afoot when we're asleep? Because if you think about it, you know, being asleep is being extremely vulnerable. And how would we survive the winter? You know, we'd have to bulk up a bit right uh, before we go to sleep, and then we'd wake kind of light. If you overslept, you'd wake very light. It could be dangerous, <laughs> you know. So there's all sorts of interesting ideas that, you can, that I can play with, and then start putting the story on top of that. And that's what I mean by the, the narrative dare. So often I don't have a really good idea, but I do have a thread by which all these stories hang by, and that is this kind of narrative, narrative dare sort of concept. Yeah. Now, you were asking about Shades of Grey sequel, weren't you? Yes, there's always that. That, that, that has um, supplanted the, um, the Thursday Next movie question as the most asked question. Uh, when are we going to see a, uh, a sequel of Shades of Grey? Um, for people who haven't read Shades of Grey, my Shades of Grey, as I said earlier, the concept of this is that it is a, a world order which is based entirely on visual colour. Um, this was an idea that I really, really like because um, colour is wonderfully interesting. Um, I'm sure there's lots of, yeah, there's a bit of, look, there's a bit of red there, you see. Um, now, this isn't red, you see. You make this red. Red is a sensation, and it belongs to you and you alone. This is only reflecting red. It's only motion of material. Your eyes picking it up, and in the visual cortex of your head, you are clothing it in something that is known to you and you alone, maybe the rest of us, as something called red. But it has, it's an abstract concept. It's just the way in which we interpret the world around us. So when you look at a, a sunset and you go, wow, look at those beautiful colours, don't congratulate the sunset, congratulate yourself, because you have interpreted it into this beauty, which it doesn't have. It has no beauty. There is nothing out there in the, in the, in the world except motion and material, and that light bounces off surfaces some ways in one way and some ways in another. And it just allows us to better understand the world and... Uh, and survive in a hostile environment. So I kind of like that idea, this incredibly abstract concept, yet of course colour is very, very important to humans. Um, so I, th I thought, right, what we'll do is we'll actually m create a world. It's a post-apocalyptic story about 1,500 years into the, the something that happened, which we don't really know about, and it's about a character who, uh, who, wants, to be, uh, who wants to just not be anything special, uh, but he's sort of thrust into a world of... Uh, of visual colour politics, because uh, the way in which uh, this, this community is led is not by anything much such uh, ridiculously mundane as being voted onto something, but you're, um, it's based on the colours that you can see. And if you can see a lot of red, then you become the head red prefect. Uh, if you can see a lot of yellow, you'll be the top yellow prefect. If you can see a lot of blue, you'll be the top blue prefect. That's how it works. And you take your Ishihara test, you remember those little coloured dots? You take your Ishihara test at the age of 18, and your whole life is mapped out for you. Because it never changes, your colour color vision never changes. And, also, and, it, uh, and I have a long sequence explaining that all, you know, all decisions are essentially taken for you. Your entire life is mapped out, and all in the time it takes to uh, um, you know, make a sandwich. Um, so it's a rather sort of an interesting idea, and it's a kind of rather exciting idea. Uh, and I wrote this, I think it was like 2011 or something, did it come out? I'm not sure now, 2010, something like that. It took me two years to write, it took a long time to write. Uh, and I thought this would, you know, catapult me to instant superstardom, of which, you know, I have, um, you know, um, begged Providence for many years now. Um, sadly, it didn't, <laughs> actually. Um, and it's, uh, for many years, it was actually not selling at all well, probably because it wasn't Thursday Next, and I'd been known for Thursday Next. Um, but more and more people are being switched on to um, Shades of Grey. Um, and which I'm delighted for, and I get lots of very, very generous emails, and people say that they really, really love it. When am I going to do a sequel? Getting around to answering your question now. Um, what I'm doing is um, I'm writing this book now, Early Riser, which is what it's called, about the, the hibernation, about a, a sleep marshal, a deputy sleep marshal, whose first season is working through the night in a tiny little village where everything is a bit kind of weird. Um, then I've got, um, then I think I've got uh, the next one of this to come out, the next. Um, the next the Last Dragon Slayer book. I've got to write that one. Um, I've got a, another standalone, which I've half written. And after that, I'm doing a Shades of Grey prequel, which isn't about the characters, but it's set in the same world. 
So essentially you'll get to know who these people are, why they are like they are, and what was the something that happened. Um, although the characters, Eddie and Jane from Shades of Grey, won't be born for another 1,500 years. That give you a very good idea about what's going on. So that's kind of what's, uh, what's happening, what's afoot in that respect. And then a Thursday? And then maybe another Thursday. <laughs> yes, um, Thursday. Uh, dark Reading Matter is the next Thursday. I've been, dark Reading Matter. I've been, I've been setting this up for many years now. <laughs> um, I love the idea of Dark Reading Matter uh, because the, 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 in, the, in, the, in the book world in which Thursday, uh, Thursday lives, um, uh, leading bookologists have, uh, have said that, in fact, the, um, for the, the readable uh, reading matter it only accounts for 12% of the total reading matter. Uh, and, in fact, there's a huge quantities of dark reading matter uh, which exists out there that has been written and then, and then disposed of or has been in writers' memories when they die. And if there is some way to get into the dark reading matter and, and see all this stuff, then it would be, could be very exciting indeed. Um, I kind of like that concept. It's kind of fun, isn't it? But that would be dark reading matter, and that would be the next Thursday. But I can't see that happening for another th three or four years, unless I can, unless I can read, write faster. <laughs> you see, it's not fair. You guys can read a book in a day, and it takes me like, takes me like seven or eight months to write it. So um, if, we, if only we could do it the other way around, it'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'd write it in a day, and it would take you seven, seven months to uh, read it. To be fair, you should actually read it at the same speed that I write it, really, to be fair. You know, you know make it last a lot, lot longer. Anyway, another, uh, another question. Another question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many books you made? How many books have I written? Ooh, let me think now. I've, I've published 14, and I've got another two books which I haven't published, which are sitting on my hard drive that I wrote before I got published. Uh, and one of, one of them is called It Was a Dark and Stormy Night, because it, uh, it's a really corny title. It's a bit like The Eye of Zoltar, really. I do like slightly corny titles. See, The Eye of Zoltar is a little bit corny, isn't it? I, I did another book um, called The Woman Who Died a Lot. Um, and that is, I really like that title, because it's just a sort of rubbish title a very bad thriller writer would come up with, because it doesn't make any sense, The Woman Who Died a Lot. But actually, if you read the book, it does make a lot of sense, because she does die a lot in it. Um, so that's quite fun. Uh, and then there's another, there's one, there's, there's uh, the, yes, so there's the, um, there's that one, and then I've got another one, which I can't remember at the moment. Anyway, uh, yeah, I've got two books that I, that I haven't published yet. So in fact, I think I've written 14, I'm working on my 14th, 15, so I think I've written 16, which is, which is quite a bit, actually, isn't it? It's a, nearly two million words. Yeah, quite a lot, quite a lot. Yes. When you write, um, how much time do you spend a day, and, like, how do you balance it with other activities, including your own reading? Ah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, yeah, question there is, um, uh, how much time do I spend a, d a day writing? Um, yeah, it's a funny one, that, because often I'll be spending a lot of time with thinking. I actually, I actually unplug myself from the internet, uh, because that is, it's so tempting to just, just check uh, eBay for something that I don't need, um, you know, because it's of vital importance to look on, e on eBay for stuff that you can't possibly have any use for. Um, so I just pulled the plug downstairs and, um, you know, not on the back of the computer because it'd be too easy to put it back in, wouldn't it? So if you actually go downstairs and get stand on a stool and unplug it at the wall, I find it's a lot easier. So I do that and then I think about things and I work a little bit like this and, uh, and I'll sort of edit maybe the last, um, the, the previous day's work. And that might take a little while. And, and, and if I'm, it's generally that's sort of how the day works, is I'll go back over stuff I wrote yesterday, and that'll take me sort of maybe till, you know, sort of early afternoon. Um, but whilst I'm doing that, I have other ideas, and I change things here, there, and everywhere, and I can be flashing backwards and forwards through the manuscript. Uh, and then in the afternoon, I go, right, I should actually be doing some, you know, fresh work, you know, at the coalface, and then I'll just sort of start writing uh, another couple of thousand words. But often I never get there that far, and I spend the whole day editing and rewriting and having ideas. Um, and sometimes we go around the houses four times, and then y literally, you know, five minutes before I've got to st start making the supper, I'll go, ah, that's the idea, that's the work, I've just done the day's work, because I've had this really good idea about something that's going to happen. Uh, and then I quickly write down roughly what's going to happen, and then the following day I can do 2,000 words. And bang, it's done. So there's no real hard and fast rules to how it works. And some days I can do five, six thousand words in a day because I know exactly where, where the story's going. 
And other times, don't get any done at all. You know, useless. I get somebody, somebody comes around and, oh, hello, Jasper, I just thought I'd pop in and see how you are. You know, blah, blah, so tell me about so-and-so. And, you know, you never want to say, oh, go away, leave me alone, I'm writing. You know, you, one has to be sort of quite pleasant, really. Um, uh, so, and then, of course, the, the, the morning may be gone. And, uh, and I can't do any writing at all. So it's, it's, you know, it's in fits and starts. But sometimes I actually take myself off um, you know, to a cafe where I don't know anyone in the next town. And I'll just sit there all morning with you know, no internet, nothing. And I will at erase everything off my uh, laptop except for the work I'm working on and just absolutely get down to it. Because um, it can be get, get a bit frustrating sometimes if I'm not getting any words down. Because you know, it's important to get a lot down early on so you've got something to work with. Like a sculptor working in clay, you know, once you've got the clay there, it's easier to work on. But if the clay's not there, it's a little bit harder, you know? Yeah. Um, right, I've uh, got five minutes left. Um, any other questions? Do we have any other questions? Yes? I was wondering if you could talk about your photography. Uh, talk about my photography? Uh, what, from Instagram, you mean? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, I have um, huge amounts of hobbies and interests. I mean, I'm... As it says on my Instagram, sort of, you know, describe yourself in how many words. I'm interested in stuff. Um, you know, um, so my, my epitaph, perhaps, on my, on my gravestone, you know, um, you know, author and father, mostly father, interested in stuff. <laughs> That's kind of what I'd like, really. But you can't really write your own epitaph, can you? Um, I have many, many interests. Um, photography being one of them. Um, for some reason, I have a, a holy... Um, a, a holy sort of um, illogical love affair with chemical uh, photography. I still use film. I don't use digital. I use film. I process it myself. Um, I generally scan it in when I'm doing things like Instagram, but I also have a, a dark room with this huge, uh, what was once very expensive and larger, but now incredibly cheap, as they all are, um, on eBay, um, <laughs> where I spend a lot of time with things I, I don't, can't possibly need. I, I don't really know why. But I, I do love photography, although it has sort of changed over the past few years. But I, I have carried on sort of carrying this torch for using, using film and, and different types of chemicals. And it's still, it's still exciting. You, you roll a film. You don't just plug it in and view it. And you go, oh, look there, got it. You've got a film. You have to process it. There's all this sort of, uh, sort of um, how the best to explain it. Um, sort of a way, a, a, a sort of workflow that you have to go through and at the end of it then you can look, look at it and go right, did that work? You know, because it requires a certain degree of skill and I kind of think that in this post-skill world that um, trying to attain sort of, uh, trying, to, trying to attain a really good photograph yet using skill rather than just sort of Photoshop or whatever uh, to me is more exciting uh, but the, the curious thing is of course this is an entirely romantic notion because really, to be honest, the method of capture when it comes to photography is immaterial. It's all about the moment and the timing uh, and the subject and the access. Um, some of the best photographs in the world were taken with extremely dodgy, ropey, ropey equipment. Um, and the best cameras in the world will not give you a good photograph. So it's, um, it's a romantic notion with me. Um, but I've just carried on with it. Ever since I had my first darkroom, aged eight, in the cupboard under the stairs. But it's, um, it's still exciting. Uh, I still, you know, to get a buzz out of it. Don't know why. I don't, probably the eight-year-old in me still. But, uh, you know, if you, I always think that um, if you're a grown-up and you can hang on to the, the excitement that you used to perhaps have as a child, then there's a certain degree of wonder one can still have with the world. And I, I still, I'm just, just sort of holding on to that. Um, yeah, I'm interested in uh, vintage cars, vintage aeroplanes, movies, theatre, music, everything. Um, I don't have enough time. Which what? French Fre not French movies, no. Not French movies, no. <laughs> not unless you're going to weaponize them. No, French movies. The, the English have a very strange, the British have a very strange sort of um, love-hate love affair with the, uh, with the French, um, you know, so, um, which is crazy, really, because we're actually the best of friends. But we, don't, we claim not to understand one another, and it's a sort of friendly rivalry. Um, and there's always a dig at the French in nearly all of my books, um, which is, um, I, find, I find kind of amusing. And so do the French, actually, and they, they, they publish them in France, and they, so like, they like it. I am published in France, yeah, and, and they think it's funny there as well. You know, oh, it is you know, le, le roast beef, oh, Albion. <laughs> you know. So um, anyway, there you go. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. About yes, yes, it did, yeah. Um, oh, we actually sort of come to the end. Is, shall we make this the last question? Yeah, go on then. 
have you been translated to other languages? And if you have been, how does it work? How do you uh, convey in the translation what you, the subtlety of your books? Well, I, I don't do any translating myself, yeah. obviously. Um, and of course, uh, a, a translated book, and it has been translated into about 18 languages, I can't know whether it's any good or not. Um, so, so it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really work. But, um, but the most, uh, it's, it's translated into Germany, uh, into German and French, and th they sell very well in, in German, German and French. The others, a uh, small amount, but, um, but they do sell. Um, right, I think that's, um, that's about um, sort of where we've come to the end, really. That's, that's nicely sort of an hour. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming to listen. I, I hope it's been fun. We've sort of been around the houses a bit, T told you a little bit about the Eye of Zolta, which is published today, uh, which is wonderful news. Um, and uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for coming, and I hope it's been enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you there we go. So thank you. For those of the internet audience, we have the book for sale. So if you'd like us to um, get it signed, you can call the number that's on the screen. For those of you who are here, we have it right behind the counter to your left. We also have the three for the Chronicles of Chasm and then the other titles, the backlist titles, such as uh, Thursday Next, Air Chronicles, and everything else. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you.